last week I had to do a men's day afternoon service at another church and I said I thank God for my pastor who licensed me, ordained me and installed me. I had to explain that even though I am out on my own I still have somebody that I can call on if I need some advice and some instruction. The pastor shared with me that I would be preaching today. It just took me back and I started going through an old box. This old Bible here, before I get started, is raggedy and falling apart. But I turned to the first page and I was sticky notes that he gave me over 16 years ago. When he gave it to me, this Bible was new. But the first scripture that he gave me to read was 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. The third passage of scripture that he had given me was in Jeremiah, the first chapter, explained it to me that God knew me before he formed me in my mother's womb. But that, that second scripture he had given me in Corinthians talks about how we are troubled on every side. I didn't understand it then, but I understand it now. He gave me that during a time of my life that all hell had broken loose. It had broken loose so bad that it broke me. But the first scripture he gave me to read it's found in the book of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, the 38th and the 39th verse. And I just want to read that. I can hear his voice saying, Now, Melvin, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure of him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition but of them that believe to the saving of the soul yes, soon after April 2001 he had to preach at Second Calvary where Dr. Jeffrey Gunn serves as the senior pastor and he gave me a Bible a New International Version Study Bible this is when I thought the Bible worked by page numbers not by names and it says, Melvin, I'm grateful that God has allowed us our paths to cross. I covenant with you to be with you through all of what you are facing. I'm trusting God to complete the miracle in your life. But never quit. Never allow anyone or anything to reduce you to a level that God has not brought you from. And he said, and always, no, I got your back. Stay focused and stay alert, peace and power, Melvin O'Mariner. Then when he presented the Bible, it said, Brother Melvin Cotton, man of destiny. Dr. Mariner. Senior Pastor, Grove Baptist Church, April 19, 2001. And he said, for whatever one in the spirit. Excuse my tears, but uh, I love our pastor. I love him because when everybody saw me as a thug, he saw me as a theologian. When everybody else saw me as a man that sold drugs, he saw me as a man of destiny. <laughs> I tell y'all, I love our pastor. When everyone else counted me out, he counted on me. So I'm happy to be here today and I move forward. I uh, thank my wife for uh, dating me to Grove today. Usually she's home tending to the children, but we are minus two that are in college, so I'm glad she's here. Thank God for this moment. I thank Pastor Mariner for this moment, and I also thank all of you for this moment. 
And I thank my brother Melvin Wolford for showing up at this time. If you have your Bibles, I ask that you journey with me to the letter to the Hebrews. The letter to the Hebrews, the 13th chapter. The letter to the Hebrews, the 13th chapter. never used to cry back in the day, I guess I have it stored up so all of it comes out now, amen? Hebrews, the 13th chapter, I remember Brother K.O. telling me about chapter 11, the faith chapter, I have some great members of this place, Hebrews, the 13th chapter. I serenade you with these words. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember those in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, your pastor who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way and of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this moment, this preach moment in which we hear from on high. God, I ask now that you speak to me and through me. Give me all that I need to speak your word to your people. I believe that your word is true, so it will not return unto you void. God, bless us with your word in Jesus' name. And those that love the Lord say amen man. If I could speak for a few moments this morning, I'll speak from the topic, the same Jesus. The same Jesus. On this joyous day in September, we are still celebrating the 27th pastoral anniversary of our pastor. Church family, we find ourselves in the letter, letter rather, epistle written to the Hebrews. This particular epistle is one that is oftentimes accredited to have been written by the Apostle Paul. However, I must admit that I am not in agreement with that because as an oftentimes questionable apostle, Paul had no problem testifying and letting people know through his salutations preambles and introductions that he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. Dr. Mariner, please forgive me, I just need to teach for a few moments and I promise I'll carry myself on down to Virginia Beach. But many question Paul's apostleship because of his past life of being a Christian killer. Excuse me, but let me be homiletically and biblically correct because during the time in which Paul was killing such people, they were not yet called Christians. They were not called Christians until two chapters after Paul's conversion in the Acts of the Apostles. They were not called Christians until they all met in a place called Antioch. So the fact of the matter is that Paul was actually a Jesus believer killer. I'm not as hard on Paul as others because if the truth of the matter be told is all of us have a past. 
Come on, church, you can sit there and act like God has never delivered you from anything. But I believe that there are a few of us in here this morning, a few of us here that don't mind testifying that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, we could raise the question, where would we be? Some of us would be locked up in prison, strung out on drugs, would have lost our minds a long time ago, would be locked up in a mental facility, or about to commit suicide. Uh, church family, you all have to excuse me this morning, but I believe that there are, I am in the midst of some folk that have some real God did it testimony. I believe in the midst of, I'm in the midst of some people that have been redeemed as well as rescued. Uh, so I can refree, refree, rephrase this a little bit, make it personal by saying, if it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Somebody is saying to themselves, I might still be locked up in prison. I might still be stung out on drugs. I might still be an alcoholic, might still be homeless, might still be contemplating suicide, still be unemployed, still be in foreclosure, still be in an abusive relationship. And for those that live like I did, I might be buried in my grave, but God, is there anybody here that has a but God testimony? I got laid off from my job, but God. My teenage daughter has gotten pregnant, but God. My son done messed around and got in trouble, but God. My doctors had a negative doctor's report, but God. I gotta get back into my sermon, but it's something about when I come through that tunnel to my hometown of Portsmouth. God has a way of reminding me of who I used to be, what I used to be, and the sinful state he found me in. Oh, don't judge me. Some folk act like God did not find them in some strange places. Uh, I come to tell you today that church, there are times in our lives that God will remind us of where he has brought us from. And when such times occur, just know it is by way of the same Jesus. Oh, church family, I've said all this to say it is a strong possibility that Paul was not the writer of Hebrews. I'm able to boldly say this because he's not the only person that God pulled out of a situation. I'm quite sure there are many of us that can write a book about some Hebrews. Because we're Bible readers, we're able to tell the history of how God has been there along, not the way, but the whole way. Oh, this anonymous letter uh, written, letters, this anonymous writer of this letter to the Hebrews, the Jewish Christians, those who believe that the long-awaited Messiah and King had come, whoever the author was, he or she knew the Jewish history. Theologians plausibly suggest that the author of Hebrews could possibly have been Priscilla, Barnabas, Apollos, or Clement of Rome. I must say in my Christocentric preaching, the author of this book is of little importance. I say this because whoever the author was, he or she knew Jesus and that it what was really important was who Jesus is. I can say this with liberty because every chapter makes reference to our Jesus. The way the author unfolds the premise of this book is by walking the readers through history, explaining how Jesus has always been and is present. Catch that, always been and is present. Well, church, as we take an exegetical view of this chapter 13 of Hebrews, there are a few things God wants us to see as we answer the relevant question. 
Pastor Ruder Seal, my relevant question on this morning is, how as believers do we continue to survive in a world? How do we continue to survive in this world with all the hell in life that we've been through? How, how do we survive knowing that we never know what tomorrow is going to bring, whether it's going to be good events or bad events? How do we survive in this thing called life? Church family, there are some folk here that have survived divorce, have survived bankruptcy, imprisonment, sexual abuse, and losing a loved one. As I look around this meeting place, there are some people that I know that have survived cancer and others that are currently surviving cancer. Oh, pastor, I've been preaching for 10 years and pastoring for three of them, but doc, you have been pastoring, you've been preaching for 33 years and pastoring for 27 of them. In the back of my mind, I have a question that I've been wanting to ask you, and that question is, how in the world have you been able to do this for so long? Oh, family, y'all got to excuse me. Don't judge me. But during my first two years of pastoring, I've called pastor on many occasions. And I've said to him, I'm tired already. I've had enough. Oh, it's not easy pastoring us. Negroes have Negro problems. It's not easy dealing with us all the time. He would sit there sometimes in person and just laugh and say, son, just love the people. Oh, his comment of just love the people pushes us and carries us to the first verse of our text, which declares keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. That meaning those of the household of faith, the first answer to the anonymous writer gives us is in regards of us being able to continue to survive is that we have to keep on being charitable. In other words, God is saying no matter what we have to love, no matter who we have to love, we have to love all people. The continuous loving of people means that we have to love people beyond their faults. It means that we are called to love when people do not reciprocate the love that we have extended and expressed towards them. We have to love folk no matter how ugly they may act. Uh, think back to when we never went to church. Think back to when we did not know God. Even though we did not know God, he still loved us. Yes, during that Jesus, the Bible declares that Jesus loved us because we first loved him. How do I know that he loves us because the Bible tells us so? John, the beloved writer, said we love Jesus because he first loved us. God is clear and specific in this text about whom we should love. Not only are we to be charitable to the members of the household of faith, Verse 2 tells us we are charged to love mysterious folk whom the Bible describes as strangers. As well as we are charged to love those who are in prison and those whom the Bible call the mistreated. But lastly, I love this, in verse 4, the Bible stresses the point of us loving our mates in whom God has married us to in holy matrimony. That covers everybody, but on the flip side, the text says, with all of the love we express, keep our love away from money. Pastor told me, never let money be a concern of your preaching. Never let money be a concern of how you're going to survive. You all know what the old J's said about the love of money. It causes people to steal from their own brother. Paul tells Timothy the same thing by saying the love of money is the root of all evil. But the second answer to the anonymous writer's question he gives us about how we can continue to survive is by not loving or lusting after money. We must be content with what we have. I like this part because 
right here. I like this because there was a time in my life, I'll be transparent, that I did not have any money. I didn't have no place to call my home. I didn't have a job, neither did I have a car. All I had was Jesus. But look at the text in the latter part of verse 4. The anonymous writer say, is saying, if you have, if you be content with what you have and content with what you may not have, as long as you got Jesus, you don't need nobody or anything else. The reason you don't need anybody or, or anything else is because God promised he would never leave us nor forsake us. Thirdly, the Bible tells us in verse 7 to be confident that the Lord is our helper. To be confident means to have a strong belief or to be fully assured. So when the text says to, to, to us to be confident, the Lord is saying, is saying the Lord is our helper. It means that no matter what comes my way, no matter what valleys that I have to travel through, no matter what pitfalls I may fall in, what pitfalls we may fall in, the Lord will help us out. Pastor, I've, I've, I've been studying this thing called pulpit. The word pulpit is in the Bible only one time, and I believe those of us that have the privilege of gracing the pulpit, uh, we have this grace of pacing the pulpit is because we've come successfully through some pits in our lives. A preacher should not be able to grace God's pulpit until God has pulled him out or poured her out of some pits. Because as we preach in the pulpit, we need to be able to tell God's people. We need to be assured, be able to assure God's people that, at, that once upon a time, and not too long ago, we should be able to testify that God had to pull us out of some pits in our lives. But lastly, verse 7 said, remember your leaders. The word leader is plural because the anonymous writer is writing to the Hebrews and, and they all were involved with different church settings. But on the day God is speaking to us here at Grove, so I see the text is saying, remember your pastor. Remember your pastor who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of his way of life and imitate his faith. The last answer the text gives in regards to the question of how we are able to keep surviving is we must be consistent when it comes to our conduct. We must be consistent when it comes to our character. Pastor has always said, Melvin, having a good name is important. He said, people won't follow you if you're not of good conduct and of good character. Uh, when I look at this text, I must admit that I see Grove in the text. I see Grove in the text because this church has been charitable, content, confident, and consistent. But I took another look and I see our pastor. When I took another look, I see our pastor in the text because as members of this branch of Zion, be, I see our pastor because he is the one that speaks the word of God to us about being charitable, con content, confident, and consistent. The question is, what greater faith could we ever imitate than the faith of our leader? But Pastor Mariner and church family, I took one more look took one more look. I took one more good look. And this time when I looked at the text, I was able to see Jesus. I was able to see Jesus because I've been tearing with him for quite some time. Verse 8 declares that this Jesus that I see is the same today, tomorrow, and forever. Dr. Mariner, as I make my way to close this little sermon, I admit that I finally got it. I finally got it because the reason that we all are able to keep surviving is because when you have been preaching about this same Jesus for the past 33 years, after all the sermons I've set under, after all the calls I've made, 
after all the Bible studies I've set in, I finally got it and I understand who this Jesus is. After sitting under your prophetic preaching and teaching for 16 of your 27 years, you've been pastoring. I can see how we are able to survive this thing called life. I finally realized that we're able to survive this thing called life because you've been preaching and teaching about the same Jesus. The same Jesus that woke all of us up this morning. The same Jesus that woke us up out of a slumber called sleep. Does anybody know the same Jesus? The same Jesus that pulled you out of some crack or crevice. The same Jesus that lifted you up off of your bed of affliction. Maybe I'm preaching to myself, but I can see this same Jesus in the text. Does anybody know this same Jesus? The same Jesus that never changes. The same Jesus that has stayed the same from the beginning of time. The same Jesus that defies the ticks of time. I've heard folks say the same old Jesus. But the thing about God, he does not get old. The Hebrew writer says that he is the same Jesus of yesterday, today, and forever. See, there is no wasness to Jesus because there's only a isness to Jesus. Nobody can say that Jesus was my bridge over troubled waters. They have to say that Jesus still is my bridge over troubled waters. Nobody can speak of the past of what Jesus was because the same thing that he was is the same thing that he is. I heard somebody say that he is my healer. I heard somebody say that he is my battle axe. I heard somebody say that he is my help in times of trouble. I've heard somebody say that he is my all in all. I've heard the old preacher say he's my everything because there is no wasness to Jesus. But I ask the question, does anybody know this same Jesus? If you know this same Jesus, stand to your feet and give God a hand clap of praise. See, I've been serving this Jesus for nearly 17 years. Through all my mess ups, my bump ups and my mess up, God has not let me down. The same Jesus that saved you is the same Jesus that saved me. Pastor, the same Jesus, the one that called you to preach, is the same one that called me to preach. Can I talk about my same old Jesus? Do you know the same Jesus? I'm talking about Mary's baby boy. I'm talking about Matthew's king of kings. I'm talking about Luke's perfect gentleman. Mark's humble servant. And John's God from on high. Does anybody know my Jesus? I'm talking about the one that had always had your back. When people left you, he stayed right there. I'm just talking about the same old Jesus. The same Jesus that saved us all. Do you know my Jesus? I said, do you know my Jesus? Oh, y'all acting like you don't know him. You're acting as if you've never met him. But get in some trouble. Get sick. Or get down and out. Try losing a child. Try losing a parent. And I guarantee you will know my Jesus. The same Jesus that's always been there. The same Jesus that's going to always be there. Oh, my God, if you know Jesus, just give him a hand clap of praise right now. The same Jesus that I heard Pastor preach about that October morning back in 2000 has brought me a mighty long way I don't know who God is speaking to today but I stand here as a living testimony of how God can change you in your situation 
before he changes your situation. The Spirit is telling me that there's somebody here. You feel like you're stuck where you are, but you've come to the right place. You've come to the right place because Jesus is here. You've come to the right place because God dwells here. And you've come to the right place because his spirit is moving in here today. As preachers, Dr. Cosby said that we have a product that never spoils. My question to you today is, do you know Jesus? I often call him my Jesus because I take him very personal now. I've come here this morning to celebrate with our pastor, but I've also came here on assignment. I came here on assignment to tell somebody that Jesus can change your life. I've come to tell somebody that Jesus as my grandmother would say, is still in the blessing business. And on the day, I must be about my father's business. So I suggest the question, is there anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? I've gotten so I enjoy studying the word of God. 